What's up, guys? Welcome back to the channel. I'm Billy Collins. Matt do -do 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 J. This is Magician. And the Jock. Guys, we have... Yeah. Jordan. Jordan. Riley. Riley. He lives in my neighborhood. AKA Jordan Neighbor. I just learned... I was going to say, Jordan <laughs> Neighbor on the on the podcast, but man, welcome, dude. Thanks Thank for coming you. in. I'm glad to be here. Now, uh, Jordan has uh, hit the full spectrum of things from the military to private... Uh, sector to, yeah he's big and he's done music he's, I mean, he, he's done it all like he's but no I, I wanted to have him on obviously like a renaissance man in here. well first of all he lives in my neighborhood so I used to you know my son was when he was like one or two I'd pull him on the wagon and I'd always stop in Jordan's yard and pull weeds and like take a video of me pulling weeds be like this is unacceptable they weren't weeds it was just they were runners, around. yeah. But um, no, in talking, found out his backstory a little bit. Um, former military, now um, kind of converted into an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I, we have a lot of military around here, so I just thought it would be really cool to talk. You know, we don't want to hear about, unless you want to tell us, about <laughs> brutal murders that you did in, in foreign lands. <laughs> but but, you, we, but the we transition is really the, interesting. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the, the transition from... Like I said, being, we talked beforehand about going from like a group perspective and to like now right. you're kind of on your own. Yeah. Like in the shift and the focus that you have to readjust to that. So, yeah. So, but maybe before we get into that, maybe let people know what are you doing now if someone was looking to hire Mr. Jordan Neighbor? What kind of stuff do you guys do? So, um, we, um, we're actually building in um, Beaufort Club over in Beaufort, the uh, golf course over there. I'm a buddy of mine, and I, um, we started a, um, he's a builder, he's a general contractor, and so we um, got hooked up with some guys, and we um, started developing what's left in that neighborhood. We're building houses out there now, and we've got a few out, um, things going on on the island. Um, There's a lot, just, of wait, a lot of wait time for materials now, it seems Yeah, like. I mean, dealing with, dealing with that kind of stuff, I mean, a window could take 16 weeks to, to get in, so. Yeah break something midway through a job it's it's not really the easiest time to get things rolling and yeah. it's hard to find people to do things and so it's interesting but um we're doing a lot of building around the area well, mostly residential stuff yeah new homes uh, custom homes anything you know pretty much it started out where we were just doing home repairs you know yeah that, i remember just, he was telling me about that like hey there, there is a market because once you get in, you get bigger and you want bigger jobs. And then it's kind of the one-offs that are hard to find anyone. I mean, big construction companies, they're not going to come in and fix your drywall. or do, you right. know, They're yeah. not going to touch something. Yeah. For, so, so basically you were kind of like a handyman at first? Or well, it started it out where it was just like, progressed? you know, we wanted to build houses. My buddy got his, his general contractor's license and um, his goal was to build you know, beautiful custom homes. And, and then it, it was just finding the capital to do so is difficult. You can't just go and... You know, pull out a construction loan and have this money to just start building these, you know, big houses. But yeah. um, so we had to start somewhere. So we just started with just finding any job. We took the the scraps that you know yeah. we would get calls from from buddies that are just like, hey, I heard this job and you know I don't have time for it, which is kind of like code for I don't want to do it. Right. And so I was like, I don't have enough time for it. You want it? And we're like, sure. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll do What's it. that whole process of crawling before you run? Yeah, and it was really doing things that you didn't necessarily want to do i mean and it was just the two of us so it wasn't yeah. like we were able to subcontract things it was like no we let's go buy you know if we needed a tool we'd just go buy the tool specific to what we needed and that's kind of how it is it. as a, when you become an adult i've realized that now yeah. that I'm, when you buy your first house you're like i have the general like starter kit of tools that someone got you for christmas but the it's hammer, like the screwdriver i don't know what i need okay i need tape. that yeah but so let's um maybe kind of rewind the tape where are you from originally Kind of all over. My dad was a pilot. Um, he flew commercial for a long time. He became a test pilot. We moved a lot. I, lived, um, I was born in Texas. We've moved from Texas, Virginia. We lived in France for a little while when he was doing some some training work. And, huh. um, and, uh, and then we ended up here. I moved here when I was 13. We lived in like the Lake Norman area of like northern Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then... Um, from there, I was living there when I enlisted, so I moved to Jacksonville when I got stationed at Camp Lejeune. So yeah. from there, when I transitioned out, you know, like Moorhead City in this area was kind of where we would escape, you know, get sure. out of Lejeune, get out of Jacksonville for a while, come up here. Come up to the big city. You know, the go. The big city of yeah. Moorhead. Yeah. Just, just to get out of, the, you know, 
well, town. But you didn't join the military right out of college. You no, I was, tw so I was 24 when I left for boot camp. And at boot camp, I turned 25. So I left in June. Um, Which to me sounds so young. But it does. But yeah. it, to me, it felt, I mean, it feels like ages ago, you know, yeah. and it just, it, 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 but it is young. I mean, it still is pretty. It's young in like, the grand you, scheme of things. You don't really still camp. know what you're going to do right. with your entire life. Yeah. So I. Um, Where'd you do boot camp at? In Paris Island, South Carolina. Which I think most people do that, especially on the. Four yeah, so the way it works is like when you've got the penalty. you've got the Mississippi River. If you enlist east of the Mississippi, you're going to go to Paris Island. If you're west, you know anywhere from Texas or over, you're going to end up going to Camp Pendleton in California, yeah. which is mm. a totally different experience. You know, out there it's it's desert and mountainous, and in uh, in Paris Island it's just swamp and swamp, beach, buck. and mosquitoes. Yeah. Humidity. And then each, of course, each side has their own, like, you know, ours is harder because it's this, ours is harder because it's yeah. that. It's, it's really what, what on earth? Relevant. So what did you do? Did you go to college? No. What did you do between high getting so, out of high school to, like, were yeah. you a criminal that, that, that this was your said, sentence? Here's your options. You yeah. Go to prison. <laughs> Dear, you go to 10 military. years. You can be in prison or be a hero. Pick one. No, I, um, I actually, so it's funny because I, it was something I'd always wanted to do. It was, and I know like it's kind of a standard answer. Everyone always has like this feeling of like, yeah, this is, I've, my whole life is just oh, a culmination of. 100% the same way when they would at, at church, hey, can any veteran stand up? I'm always like that. I want to be that. You know, there's just a reverence <laughs> around it until you got to that age. And I'm yeah. like, Damn it. But so you always wanted to do it. Yeah, but I, you know, just, I don't know if it was something that just felt like it was not unobtainable, but like, you know, is it, is this my life's calling is to do this thing gotta scratch this itch while i still can yeah, and I, I i started working when i was really young my my parents were into that you know I, which i appreciate but I, I i i just went job to job to job to job it was just kind of like doing whatever i needed to do as a young adult to have my own apartment and yeah. pay for bills and then i got this great job i was working at um charlotte douglas international mm -hmm. for um an fbo which is basically where all of the general aviation flies into so instead of like if you're in a a Gulfstream private jet. You don't go to the terminal. No, I never do. You have yeah. a, <laughs> you go to an FBO, which is where like the the private jets or your even just your typical like four seater yeah. Cessnas that you see flying around here. Yeah, um, those guys go to an FBO, and I got a job there. Um, starting out fueling airplanes. Um, I'm guessing and, with uh, the connection with your dad. Yeah, of course. Pilot. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, and I grew up around aviation, so I had a general knowledge of, like, what I was kind of getting into. I knew a lot about how it worked, you know, so I could kind of keep a conversation with a pilot, not as a pilot, but just enough to where I kind of just had a general... Just enough to be dangerous. Well, enough yeah. to get a job in the industry at yeah. an entry level. Yeah, yeah. And it was cool because I ended up moving into, like, towing airplanes, so, like, your day predominantly was, like, moving. You'd get, like, a list of the tail numbers of specific aircraft that were at, at your location that had to go from one hangar to another, or it had to go, it was coming in and it was needing to get moved Man, out of the, the way. The amount was, of coordination, I mean, you just see how many flights are coming in and out at all times. Like I know. What about the celebrities? I'm sure you... A ton. I, I yeah, bet, I mean, coming out of Charlotte. Yeah, and Charlotte was cool because there, there was a, a high traffic area for the celebrity, either concerts or especially like business people. But I mean, the celebrities was fun because it just kind of make the you gotta, mundane you name day. Drop, do some name dropping. Who'd you see? Oh man, everybody. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, um, Ludacris, uh, Mariah Carey, Kiss, Luda. Fish. Um, oh man, um, any, I actually any um, Jordan sightings. Michael Jordan all of the time. I actually drove his. Uh, I don't remember if it was a Range Rover or a Land Rover, or something like that. I just you know the. The whole, like, uh, having to move closer to get to the gas pedal. It didn't have to happen a lot. I wasn't predominantly doing that. I was more of a line tech, so I was dealing with the planes. But once in a while, when the concierge couldn't go do something, he'd help out. But Man, he came through a lot. The Panthers flew out all the time. Yeah. So Cam Newton, guys like that. Um, yeah, it was fun. It's interesting to see. It makes a mundane day kind of more interesting when you've got, yeah. like, a, a bunch of... We just get, ex get excited when you see, like, because Jordan came here for... Yeah. Big Rock? Big Rock, Big yeah. Rock, yeah. 
and then I saw his plane fly over, and his plane's got him, you know, the yeah. classic symbol. So yeah. two three six Mike Juliet, I remember it because twenty three was his number. He won Stalker. six championships. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you, it was. It's there's. It's cool because with your tail number, you Blue register eyes. it to the aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> and you can make it whatever you want if you have the money to do so. And so yeah. he made it 236 Mike Juliet, which was 23 for his number six championships and then MJ. So it was wow. this thing. And then I don't know about his new one because I, when I was here, I was like, that's not the same plane I remember. But it had the Carolina blue under the wings and then it had the, you know, the logo, well, the Air Jordan logo. Catch 23 is his logo on his, on his boat. That's right, the yeah. name of his boat. So you did that and then were you just... I don't know if Did you I feel empty. Like you know, you, like the, the calling was hitting you or something. Well, it, a, a friend of mine there at that job was like, "Man, I, I want to. I, I, I can't. I can't do this anymore. This is just kind of I mean, because it becomes like this thing where we had radios, and so whenever you were needed, you were hailed on the radio, and it just mm-hmm. became like, I just Jordan, 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 mm. Jordan. It's just like, oh man, like I just went from thinking this was like the coolest thing I could be doing. I had the time of my life, and then all of a sudden it was just like, man, this is just so day in, day out. I'm going to go be my own boss, join the military. <laughs> yeah, right? So, yeah. Maybe no, better, we, I want someone to know, call me by my last name. married at this time. No, I was not. Yeah, so see, he wasn't used to the Jordan. Yeah. Jordan. Right. Well, yeah. my wife and I lived together. We were oh, dating, okay, so yeah. we were already living together. We we'd had we had an apartment. We She long, was working. How long did you guys live in sin? <laughs> Years. <laughs> <laughs> years um we were living together and mm-hmm. she had her thing where she was um she was working at a restaurant in town and so our schedules were like polar opposite i would i i was 6 a.m to 2 p.m so i was out of the house by like 5 15 and what then i'd get home at two and she'd already be at her shift for what like an the amazing evening. setup <laughs> like yeah <laughs> that was the best time. that's the secret to longevity that is the, that gold, that's yeah. the gold standard of your relationship well in my like, days off too because no one in aviation has saturday sunday off because it's 24-7 yeah. things. So yeah. you, you're, you know, it's, if you're lucky, which I was, I was first shift, which meant 6 to 2 instead of like 10 to 2, or, or excuse me, 10 to 6, that's third shift, which is yeah. brutal. But I was 6 to 2, and I had Friday, Saturday off, which is the closest to a weekend yeah. that you'll ever get. That's but having bad. Friday off is great because everyone else is working. So when you're off... You have the whole, basically the whole morning and day to do whatever you've got to do. And if yeah. she's in the restaurant industry, she was every weekend probably. Yeah, and but but then obviously that was where I would go frequently drink and hang out because we'd, you know, get the hookup from her. And, sure. Yeah. Man, so you had a guy who said he wanted to join. Yeah, he was like, I just can't do this anymore. I want to get out of here. You know, I want to join the Air Force. And the Air Force had a program um, <clears throat> that was, uh, it was... Uh, I believe it's called TACP, which is like a, it's basically where you get attached to special forces groups and then you go do, um, you deal with all the air assets. So you communicate from the ground level to the air assets. So if you're going to call in an A-10 for a uh, gun I know, run. I know some of these words. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, man. Well, like Shit. any any yeah, any aviation, this. if you have a, 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 a casualty and you need a, a helicopter to come in and pick up the casualty. Yeah. And in the special forces units, they, the Air Force has this, this, these guys that get attached to them that are qualified to do everything that has to do with dealing with aviation. Mm. And so it kind of seemed really fitting that, you know, he and, and I, when we started talking, was like, yeah, we're, we're in aviation. This is cool. We like this. So yeah. this is how it translates. But the more and more I, I really started looking into it, and, and my wife's um, cousin's husband is like a major in the Air Force, and mm. he does um, drone stuff and all that out, and I don't know where he would be now, but... Um, he, uh, I talked to him and, and with talking with him, I got really jazzed up on it. I was like, I'm, I'm, this is, I'm joining the military. I'm, yeah. I, I talked to my wife, we had a meal and I was like, I, I want to do this. I really want to do this. And she was super supportive and she was all about just, if, if you, if you want to do this and you want to, I don't know where it's going to take us, but we're, mm. uh, let's, let's do it. Um, it's a good woman. but the more and more I got into it, the more and more I thought back to, my childhood like and your, growing your up initial attraction to the military was mm-hmm. always the Marine Corps because um, I had an uncle who um, who was a Marine and um, growing up that was just I was in Northern Virginia at the time because that was where my dad was working and um, he was like a he superhero. Was, well, right. he was stationed at Quantico, so they would come over all the time, you mm-hmm. know, because we weren't yeah. too far away. And as a kid, it was he would bring 
old camis or like I remember he him having this uh, like um, ghillie netting that he mm. it was like a it was like a, a blanket but you could see through it but it was yeah, all camouflage yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and as a kid that was just the coolest thing in the entire world. That's still kind of cool just, now. I mean, yeah. I, yeah it, army, I, so you're saying the Marines is like dress up for adults is what you're saying? Well, I mean, a lot of kids grew up playing <laughs> army, and I would I would argue that I grew up playing, playing Marines Marine, yeah. because that was just you know that was by proximity the coolest person I knew and the the relative I was closest with outside of my immediate immediate family was a Marine, and so yeah. I I just there was just, I. I I kind of, I kind of sold my wife on the military thing by saying, and and I was trying to sell her on something that may have seemed a little bit s- safer by saying, yeah. if I join and do something, I don't know what I'm going to do because the, the 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 Air Force route I thought I would love was a, a kind of a far fetched dream. Anything involving special operations takes extreme amounts of commitment and and things that I was just like, look, I'm just going to join. You know, and I don't know what I'm going to end up doing, but maybe it'll be something administrative. Yeah. But I knew I wanted to be in the military. And then I told her, I was like, look, I, I, I want to join the Marine Corps and I want to be infantry. Yeah. Like, I really, if I'm, if I, I just want to do what I feel like I have to do. Yeah. And that became a little bit of a different, like, Man, really? I can't imagine. 24, 25. That's wild. Well, it, it was, it was almost easier, to be honest with you, because... Um, when you're that old and you go through what you're going to go through, um, you see how shitty the real world is. So like, <laughs> well, I mean, but you also have a lot of wisdom and, yeah. and a lot of life experience that, that some of the, the younger crowd, cause there are some dudes that you have to be 18 when you graduate boot camp, So you can be 17, 17 and go to boot. So, I mean, like I went to boot camp with some 17 year old kids and at, at 24, 25, almost 25. A 17-year-old is like a child Dang, right. compared to what you feel like yep. you are, at least yep. at the time. You can't even get in clubs. That's right. Yeah, I mean, like, you can't even... I can I mean, buy cigarettes and beer. Yeah, yeah, well, at the time, it was still 18. Yeah, right, right, Which right. is weird, which is a weird thing to think back and remember, but... Um, so, when you're, when you're at boot camp and you're doing some of the dumb things that you're doing, some of the games they play, you kind of understand, like... There's a timeline to this, right. you know what I mean? Just like, the, play along. like we're yeah. not going to do this all day, you know. Like yeah. we have other things. We, I mean, we have to do all these other yep. things. So yep. you kind of have a, a leg up on some of the guys that are mentally in this like psychological state of like this is never going to end. My life is like this forever, and it's like it's really not. Like right. give it five minutes, and these guys are going. These guys are going to get tired of doing this. Yes. And you're going to move on with your day. Yeah. So it kind of helped, in a way, it kind of was, made it a little that easier. That was similar to football because we do conditioning drills and, or, or people, would, like, they squash out the egos pretty quick probably and, and obviously in the Marine Corps. I mean, yeah. they're almost trying to break you down so they can build you back up. I've always heard that. Yeah, that's a, a thing. But you, there's probably some really obvious people that like, okay, he needs to be, he's like a wild horse that needs to be broken in. Like well, great I mean, potential, but. When you get there, you kind of, and I don't know if it, I mean, if it can translate to like a, a like a combine or a training camp. When you get there and you look at guys and you're like, how are you even here? Just sizing each other like, How, but like, how did he, of all, like who, what recruiter looked at you and was like, That's you, you're a shoe in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but, but it happens. And. I mean, these guys have their work cut out for them because when you when they get this group of, you know, eighty some odd guys in their one yeah. platoon, it's it's like they have to each and every one of those guys has to hit a specific standard. And if you have a bunch of dudes that are below, way below that, mm-hmm. I mean, when I got there, I was way below that. I hadn't I hadn't ran, mm-hmm. you know, I hadn't. I bel- I think my mile and a half time was like over twenty minutes when I when I first got there. I can't. I don't know when I've ever <laughs> run a mile and a half. Like, and I don't even think I have a time. I almost couldn't even ship when I left because you have to be able to do a certain number of X, X, and X. It was like it was a, a timed run, um, crunches or sit ups and pull ups. Mm-hmm. And the run and pull ups I could do, and I almost didn't even get to go because I could not hit the amount. I didn't have the core strength to do. The amount of oh, sit-ups you had to do. Oh, dude, that's, Seven. You can't fake yeah. abs, dude. That, no, when that stuff starts to tighten crush, up. Well, yeah. and they're pretty strict flexes. on there's your, your, like your elbows have to hit. I mean, it, was, it was a very strict deal. You couldn't fake a couple and get a few extra. And, mm-hmm. and, and so, I mean, I, I, I even struggled just to get there physically. So, it, I mean, when you get there, it's, a, it's interesting. Yeah. So huh. let's be honest. You didn't want to join the Air Force because you didn't want to go to Seymour Johnson's. 
I like that. That's no good. Bad, there's I, no bad joke like a granddad joke. Yeah. <laughs> So, well, after being a dad, I've, my repertoire is kind of... Oh, it's through the roof, man. Yeah, it's oh, grown. Yeah. It's like you have a book of them. That's, so, the, yeah, that's always fascinated me, boot camp. And, you know, it's you see that with teams, with military. You As a group, think of joining a fraternity. You, there's rushing. It, like, you have to... It's a rite of passage. Like, we all went through this shitty thing. Everyone in the military went through the same shitty thing. Right. You know, with the SEALs, they have to make it through BUDS, and, and there's all those things. That's a whole different story. That's a, yeah, that's a yeah. different, uh, that's that's a, a different that's world. A, yeah. But it's still the, that concept of, like, as a group, we all suffer through – we're all suffering together, yeah. if you will. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of interesting things that can happen in, in that whole process of – I mean, there's everything from Stockholm Syndrome to, you know, the changes you go through physically – um, Wait, even Stockholm. psychologically, Isn't that when you, get, you fall in love with like your kidneys. Oh yeah, when you get to, I mean, imagine you get to you get to boot camp and these guys are brutal to you. These drill instructors are awful, but by the end of it, you're doing everything they do, emulating every every little mannerism of theirs. I mean, they they wear their watches <clears throat> inside of their wrist so that you can't see the time. Um, ah. A lot of people have these like crazy things about like, it's, oh, it's about the glare on the, which is, I mean, guys in the in in an operation may do that for glare off the, but for them it's so you, you can't see the time so that you don't really understand what's and then going you on start the wearing your watch oh the at the, when you when you before you graduate there's about a week period where you've gone through what's called the crucible which is like the final exercise it's the culminating event of the whole process that kind of the trial by fire and then afterward you're technically a marine so you've, you've done that. You just haven't graduated. So you're there for about a week. And so you're allowed <coughs> to go to the PX on, on the, the day that you're allowed your little freedom for a couple hours. And everyone has to go out and buy a watch. And everyone comes back with their watch worn inside <laughs> out. And it's, the, it's, it's just funny to see how, how much you change from hating these guys so much to like, I have to be exactly like them. Yeah. This is my, this is my, you know, the image I have to portray. What's that scene on, what? what's that on Forrest Gump? He's like, what's your uh, duty in the army? He's like, do whatever you tell me to, drill sergeant. <laughs> He's like, that's the best damn answer I've ever heard. So, but there's some truth to that. Yeah. So, I was think, there any correlation like that? Did you admire any coach when you were in the? Um, we didn't try to emulate them, but yeah, definitely the ones that are the hardest on you. I mean, we talk about that with like male, female dynamics. You seek validation from those that don't easily give it, you know? So it's like the harder they are on you, as long as you like, you see them as someone that's got your best interest in mind, which I'm sure you do. They're, They're a drill sergeant. They've done this many times. Okay. They know what they're talking about. Even if they're a jerk, there's that trust level. Um, it's the same way with, with coaches, you know, in, in college, coaches have a ton of power. You know, you really, because especially if you're thinking about going to the next level, you know. But yeah, there's definitely some of that. So, you in the military? Then what? You're active reserve now. Is that what you? No. Know? So you do you do your your enlistment, and then when you get out, you have to do four years of inactive ready reserve, which is okay, basically. Gotcha. You don't have to do anything. Just stand by, basically. All it is is a ba- it's don't basically a way to avoid – not even that. I mean, do really – Do those crunches. Yeah. That's right. You don't really like, have you, any by, obligation. By God, could you run the mile and a half yeah, under seriously. three hours? Yeah, yeah because I couldn't – I mean, I, I'm nowhere near what I could do back when I was active duty. But all it is is a way to avoid a draft. If for any reason yeah, something were to happen, know. they could call back all of the IRR guys and that would they would basically stand – the posts here that the guys going overseas would stand. You wouldn't really have to, unless it was uh, World War Mm III, you would basically go fill in the roles, you know, here in Garrison stateside while the the active duty guys had to do what they ever did. Biden is president. You you never know. Yeah, I don't even, he doesn't know what that means. (laughs) But (laughs) what, so you were deployed a couple times. Yeah, I deployed twice, um, which is about average for an infantry unit. You, You kind of do a, it's everyone's on a rotation, especially in peacetime. There's a lot of rotations to either keep um, keep uh, people busy. I mean, a lot of it has to do with that. I mean, you can't just sit around. Um, and also, um, there's a lot going on with training our allies and doing a lot of that stuff, which is predominantly what, what we ended up doing. Um, like where, our first rotation. Where did you get deployed to? So the first time was on a B-surf, which was um, to Eastern Europe. 
So it's basically all of the Eastern European bloc countries that are NATO allies. So um, like Romania, Latvia, Lithuania, Bulgaria, um, all the people that are right now, yeah. you know, in, a, in an interesting position. Yeah. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, that deployment was the last rotation that the U.S. did to train those people. So when we were in Romania, um, we ended up um, dealing with a lot of different uh, militaries. And it was this huge um, event where we went to, um, I believe it was Latvia, and like Germans were there. It was really, it was a huge combined NATO training exercise where um, it was good guys, bad guys. You know, obviously we played the bad guys. British were there. It was really like most of the uh, the heavy hitters in NATO were, were there doing training exercises just to keep these guys that are in some of these smaller Eastern Bloc countries up to speed on, you know, how, I mean, because they're really, they're small countries. It's I like mean, a Make-A-Wish foundation for the military. So like, <laughs> bring in the big guys. You yeah, in a sense, I mean, some of these, yeah, some of these guys need to see, like, I mean, because really it's, it's and it's amazing too, um, what heroes you are to them. You know, when, when, when a, because some, I mean, with some of these guys, like for instance, the Romanians, they buy their own equipment. Right. So, you know, even just down to like a, a magazine pouch for, for the, your, their rifle, you know, they, they're, they're over there with some of the most outdated equipment that you could imagine. And it's funny because coming from the Marine Corps where you have such a small budget, you always, you're always kind of complaining about how like you never get the, you know, the, the better gear, you never have like up to date stuff, but these guys are literally spending their own money, which they don't have. They have muskets. And they're in, stuff. And they're yeah. in areas that are way more war-torn. Ab- it, yeah, and it's, like, I mean, they're coming from third-world countries right. having to defend said third-world country. Mm. And, and right now, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because these guys haven't really had, you know, they've been on their own as far as training is concerned. They, they do a lot of their own, you know, uh, in, intra-countrial training over there, <coughs> but they're not getting... What we were doing when we had that rotation going where Marines would go over there and we would have these exercises with them and kind of coordinate. I'm not exactly sure what the Army does. Um, I, they may have a thing. But as far as our rotation is concerned, I know that ended in, in 2016. Huh. Did that create a vacuum? Isn't there always talked about the U.S. pulls out? I know it's a little bit different. but like- It wasn't anything like that because we were stationed when we were there um, – when we, we would jump from country to country to do certain exercises, but when we were, we, our home base was in Romania and that was um, on an army base. So I know that that base is still there. The army is still there, but they had that base, I believe, um, I know there was an army infantry, so I don't know who's training them actually in infantry tactics. I'm not exactly sure on that. Yeah. After that, it's you just rotate back and you just kind of get back to normal, you know, back home life and just keep kind of, how, how, how long – what is it deploy? I think it's like a year. My brother was so like deployed. usually well, – it's different. So like the, the Army kind of uh, has a – it depends on what they're doing, I'm assuming. Um, I know some, some guys are deployed for a year plus. Um, in the Marine Corps, your average deployment is about seven months, um, sometimes even six if you're you – know, certain people leave earlier to go back and kind of prep for the rest of the main body to come back. Especially so. in peacetime. You know, yeah. Versus wartime, it's like. Yeah, it's a totally different story. Yeah. I mean, but even then, um, I think your your average, you know, like Marine Corps combat deployment in let's just say in, in Iraq was probably about the same seven month rotation, and then you yeah. kind of you a different unit will come in and and it's called ripping out, um, and so you get replaced by a different unit that'll come and like they, high five each other. Like, yeah, well, I mean, they come a little early. <laughs> and, the desert. Home. Yeah. yeah, and and really it becomes like that because when once the other unit shows up, you're like. Oh, this is we're done. Uh, you're it's almost check like a, out. it's like a like a tag team wrestling match where you just slap them. All right, you, you take it. I mean, I'm you kind of bring them up to speed. You're just like, hey, this is what we were doing. This is what we were dealing with. These are the people that are here. Meet so and so. Yeah. Have a good one. Here's your translator. I'm Here's going home. Yeah. yeah. That's you know, but it um, but yeah. So it was, and then the my my second deployment we did um, so we went to uh, it was the worst of deployments because it's to Okinawa, which is like the the, the dead deployment. But we ended up doing something pretty cool. We went to the Philippines for a while. What do you mean um, the dead? I've never heard that. It's, well, it's, it's, just, it's just a 
it's a is it because it's so established already it's because like yeah you're you're, you're really... going there and when you're there you're just kind of like you know we could be doing this at home right right you know like i i could be you know in bed with my wife taking a hot shower at home having dinner you know out at Whoa, you know this just took a turn Ooh. <laughs> i've seen his wife <laughs> but i just <laughs> and him take baths together <laughs> we're not we don't draw curtains in the house mm. you know but it, it's just it, it's it's more of you know, when you're there in Okinawa, it's it's brutally lame. Um, it's just depending on whether you get lucky enough to go do other stuff while you're there. Um, and then we ended up getting stuck in the Philippines, which was kind of cool because we got to spend more time there. But um, that was a, that was probably a cooler experience um, in the Philippines because um, I fell asleep on a bus after we flew in. We flew into I don't know where. Um, we and got on a there. bus. I wouldn't either. <laughs> Sounds good. No, and we got on this bus that was. Um, really sketchy um and ended up uh i ended up falling asleep and when i woke up we were just at this what looked like just this little village in the middle of the jungle it was like four yeah and it it was really i kind of i I shouldn't have fallen asleep because it was more well this is the sketchiest place ever yeah it was like it was like falling asleep here and waking up in chicago and you were just like whoa this is a different place wow um but it was a cooler experience because they they were uh, an interesting group those guys have um a huge ISIS problem um, in in the South Philippines, and so when we got with the, uh, they call them the Filipino Air Force, but they don't have an Air Force. I mean, they have an Air Force, but I don't have an airplane. They're they're <laughs> <laughs> they fly paper airplanes. They just they, well, they have they have these. Uh, they're they're in they were infantry guys, but they were part of the Filipino Air Force, and I think that you're just you know they they use a lot of terminology that we do. Yeah. Um, which again, I don't know a hundred percent. I don't know a lot about their structure, but it just seemed interesting that their air force had they an have, infantry. They and, have terrible buses. That's but one these guys had sure <laughs> these guys had just gotten back um, recently from fighting in Marawi, which was a, a pretty big battle um, for that city in the South Philippines that ISIS had taken over. And mm. so these were some pretty hardened dudes. Like yeah. Some pretty. I mean, you 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 really could just kind of tell. Um, just being around them, um, they were, uh, oh, they carried themselves. They, they, they just, they, they've been through a lot. Yeah. They had gone through a lot and, um, they did it with very little resources, which is something that uh, a lot of Marines can appreciate. You know, just doing more with less is kind of like a, a pride thing. That's where a lot of the maybe arrogant, unnecessary pride the few, that the they pride. have. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, like the, Mar- I'm, I, I, I honestly, believe that i'm pretty sure fact check me but i'm pretty sure that the marine corps annual budget is below the budget the navy gets to paint their to repaint their ships annually i'm pretty sure Mm. unless that was some kind of satirical joke that somebody said there was a a pretty reliable source that had mentioned that like the budget for for you know i mean i remember even just at the beginning of the year, we go do a, a, a range on Camp Lejeune and shooting a couple missiles and blowing through some 50 cal rounds. And all of a sudden, they're just kind of like, yeah, that's pretty much all we got for the year. Wow. <laughs> so that was the, that was Enjoy our range. It. That was our big range for the year. Wow. And now that's we're just kind of penny pinching. So e- each battalion gets a budget, and they get a certain allotment of ammunition and things to train their guys. And then they're just kind of like, yep, that was... But you guys probably rally around that. Like, we do more with less. It's, it, it's, it's probably where some of the unnecessary... It, uh, arrogance comes from is just you know i i remember getting doing a uh, a field operation and we happened to share a range with the army and this was really funny because we were out there and we were on camp lejeune um but they i guess had come down there to do uh, some kind of exercise and um they had this huge tent set up it was really cool and they had cooks and they had this whole like meal line where you'd go through and they were like it was all of you know the camaraderie and I guess this kind of like cross branch um, cohesion that Same they were trying flag. to do. Yeah, yeah, they were like, hey, you guys, we have extra. You all want to come eat? And so um, our company went over and it was like salad and they're taking to go boxes, dude. <laughs> I like we were th- we were throwing bag. MREs in the woods, just like yeah, I don't want the, you know like, like we're gonna go eat. Them. Yeah. It was cool. So, but the and, and it, it's really not anything about anything more than budget. But it, it's um, you know, to anyone that might get it, um, that's where a lot of the you know boastful arrogance comes from. Is just 
you know the why would that cause arrogance there well i mean there's a lot of people a lot of people especially in this area you really only know marines and a lot of people have kind of like a bad perception of like i hate them you you know like a couple of drunk 19 year olds come out of jacks and they have you know high fades and you're just kind of like Oh, those yeah. jerks. We have a bunch of coasties. They do travel in packs, that's for sure. They there's, do. There's a lot of our nation's heroes out we there. We only fight yeah. with three to one odds. So. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's why you, you, they run deep. So when you were – let's transition to the transition. The transition. Well, actually, I, I want to try to ask one Just before kidding. We, sure. Before we go into that, do you have a moment while you in the Marine Corps that really sticks out to you, like you know something like funny that happened or something that you opened your eyes – as far as wow, I am lucky to be. Like we we say that in, like this is welcome to the NFL moment, right? Like, did you have any? Yeah. So I, I think um, there's a lot, and that's that's one of the hardest things about the transition. If I can kind of like, hopefully, will that this will help transition into that transition. Topic. But the hardest thing is that you have so many stories and memories and experiences and things that you've shared with people and just just so much. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the things, I mean, mountain warfare training. So it's um, out in Bridgeport, California, which is in the chain of Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, and mountains are brutal. I mean, the mountain, it's the great equalizer is what mm. they say. So like a mountain is like, you may be a pro athlete and then you go play on a hillside on a mountain of nothing but scree rock where every two feet you step you slide back a foot kind of thing i mean it's really like it, it will make it'll break anybody it's right. like the water you know yeah. everyone always says it like you can no matter how strong you are you get in the water and it's a totally different story so right, right. mountain warfare training was interesting because you know with the amount of weight you carry in your your pack um i was part of a um cat section which is c-a-a-t combined anti-armor team um and so we're two different groups that kind of mesh into one so you have the anti-armor guys that are they shoot missiles so it's um everything from the tow system to the javelin which a lot of call of duty players know the javelin um and it's like the shoulder fire rocket you just spend the olympics forever yeah, yeah you know the, it kind of goes like along outdated. with the, it kind of i mean it, that's why they call it that i mean it kind of yeah. does do that whole oh, really? thing okay. um but uh and then they combine that with heavy machine guns so um those two MOSs or those two job guys, um, the anti-armor guys and the machine gunners form one group. And um, so when we did mountain warfare training, we weren't bringing missiles. So it was all machine guns and you're hiking up a mountain with 120 pounds on your back, plus a 50 cal receiver or a barrel or tripod or something. And it's brutal. I mean, it's, but to complete it, you know, like to, to yeah. hike up. And then when you get to the top of said mountain, and you drop your gear, and you the the weight comes off, and then you see the view, like snow capped mountains and things, and it's like it really is like a, like that sucked, but man, it was worth it. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like I the feel like off, that is man. almost for for most people that have gone through the military, I feel like that sums up the whole experience. Mm. It's like man, that sucked, but holy cow, was it worth it? You know, it made everything at a certain point. You you realize like, Come this is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, like this is that That's was, awesome. and I feel like that was of all the things that kind of stood out as like the, you know, the kind of uh, represented the entire experience was like. Were you disappointed at all? Well, oh yeah. That you weren't oh. in combat. Like you didn't see because I know that's big with so, guys. Yes and well yeah. I mean, there's yeah. that, that gung-ho, like, this is why I joined. When I, I, didn't join when I was at infantry school, there was – they had the news on in the chow hall when we were – and, and, like, like stuff was, stuff was popping shit. off, and, and everybody was like, oh, Where are we yeah. going? Yeah, it was, because it's – because they, they, they instill such confidence in you that yeah. you're like, I am completely bulletproof. And like, strength, so I don't Strength care. in numbers, too. Yeah. yeah, and well, and all your boys are there. So yeah, like, what, yeah. what's going to happen to me? Yeah, and yeah. if anything does happen to me – my boys got it. Yeah, you know the amount of trust and and cohesion and camaraderie and 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 just. What did uh, Bill Burr say when 
this is what we play for. <laughs> <laughs> Get that. Well, and then there's also something to be said about that. It's like, if Hell I'm going to yeah. die, this is how I would want to die. Is, you know, if, what, what do I want to, like, yeah, get hit by a car? We had Mikel Buck on, and he was talking about that, how he would retreat. He, he's and, seen a lot of combat. Yeah, yeah, and he was like, this this who I am. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And that's a whole different experience. I mean, that forges guys into a totally different thing. So, you is know. Once I, a Marine, always a Marine? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, and that's, it's amazing how similar, no matter what your experience was, how, like, I've had conversation with, conversations with guys that were Vietnam, Vietnam vets. Mm-hmm. I was on a cruise, and I met a guy that was a machine gunner in Vietnam. And, like, I don't know if he, the, the, the average lifespan of a, of a machine gunner in Vietnam was, like, six seconds. Mm-hmm. Because the moment you opened up a burst, and they Just saw the muzzle flash, your you're like, right. every gun yeah. is going to that one gun, because that's the machine gun. So you really, you didn't, and I remember him saying he did two tours, but he volunteered for his second. I was like, you're an absolute savage. And you're just volunteering, like, oh, yeah, I'll go back. Mm. It's like, you know, they're, they're drafting dudes, you know. Yeah, you're right. fine. You just go home, man. You're probably, you probably have a purple heart. I mean, you've probably been injured. And I don't think anyone did not get injured. Yeah. And no, he went back and he totally wanted to do it. But the cool thing was, is that like as big of a gap as our generation had, he was like, man, you guys nowadays, I can't imagine the amount of weight you carry, light infantry. I mean, he was just to- – and I was like, dude, like, you are a, a god. You were in Vietnam. As far as – yeah. Like, the, like We emulate war. you. Right. And he was – and he couldn't even fathom doing what the guys do nowadays, even in peacetime. So it's, it's amazing how similar the groups are and how much pride there is no matter what across – and that's something that is – that starts at the very beginning. It's just mm. like there's – it's – it's just a different world that you step into. And I'm assuming that goes for, you know, any branch. It's just each, each one has its different characteristics, but every single one, it's just a, a, a world you step into that you fully, because if you don't, if you don't fully commit to that world, if you don't fully dive into what you're doing, it's not just a job, right. you know, because, you know, like you can be bad at your job one day and so it may not, not it's not going to cripple yeah. your company. Right. But if you're bad at your job a single day in any branch of the military, it could mean at someone's life somewhere, you know. Well, that's what guys will say. Like, why do you fight for the guy on my left, the guy on my right? Like, I'd love to sure. tell you it was for flag and country, but it's like. No, because, you get because I don't it. know why I'm here, really. Right. I'm not an officer. I haven't been completely briefed. You know, the higher in rank you go, the more you know. But. But for the most part, like you, I'm not a politician. I haven't sent me and my friends here. But if something happens to my friend, yeah, there's a huge, you know, amount of sacrifice there's that would go into that. Those helicopter uh, gunners, like a door gunner, insane. I like always, I, my, I dated a girl in high school, and her her dad was a colonel. He was a pilot in the Marine Corps, and he got drunk one night and was talking about how one of the guys at the door or, or the gate or whatever they call it, where the gun is. <clears throat> got shot, mm-hmm. killed. So he jumped. He had someone, I guess the other pilot took over. He jumped and was... And took over the gun? Yeah, and this is in Vietnam. Get the gun time. up. That's the biggest thing. <laughs> yeah. that man. But it's that's... Like, that I have always said, if I if I had dudes. picked a different job, being a door gunner on a helicopter would be the coolest thing in the entire world. Because I loved aviation, and I love guns. Did you hear what he just said? <laughs> I just said, <laughs> my guy died, he just... He drug, he said, I just grabbed... He said, I just... <laughs> Move and Jordan's it like and grabbed that's, it. That's really cool. <laughs> that's, that's, man, I want to do that. Well, yeah. I mean, it's just it, it just helicopters are cool in general. Yeah, and, and so are you know miniguns. So yeah, man, <laughs> there is a little bit. I think for every man, like I talk about, like the Alexander the Great DNA. You know, mm-hmm. where you want to conquer, where you want to dominate. You know what do they say? He he wept because there were no more lands to conquer. Yeah, you know, I think I think every man has that. Um, I but think not enough have I don't I, didn't, I didn't, if I, I always say look if I didn't play college sports I probably would have I would have had to go in the military I was one of those kids I needed something to yeah be, I was a, a kid growing I needed to be beat like to, <laughs> like there's no better sleep than after a spanking dude oh like, I've seen I, I mean I had a guy in my platoon that was a Southside Crip you know self-proclaimed I don't know I don't crip, know his back well side. I don't know his background specifically you can say you're anything when you get there but. You know, these guys with some so rough bizarre. backgrounds that get morphed into this. You know, some guys need it. Well, military, gangs, it's a brotherhood. You know, it's a, it's a really big family. And it's, to be accepted. 
it's got to be tough transitioning because I was on teams, you know, and life is really, it's pretty solo. I mean, you're married, but as a man, you're to lead your family, mm -hmm. you know, um, but you're on a team, you have, everyone's got a common goal, you know, that's very rare, even in corporate America, it's a lot of people working in corporate America have no idea what, what's the goal, like, what's the point, it's just Groundhog Day, mm -hmm. you know, it might feel like that a little bit in military, but I'm sure, like, probably like a game of telephone where they whisper, here's what we're doing, and then by the time it gets to you, you're like, climb that hill, okay, climb that hill, you know. Yeah, a, a lot of it really is just kind of like, do what you're told. You know, and, and just perform at a level in which you can, you know, not get yelled at. Yeah. Or, or, you know, and for a lot of guys, it really is just that. Like, I just need to do the bare minimum and then get through this thing. We'll be okay. And for other guys, it's like, no, I, I really want to, I want to leave a, a, a mark here. Lieutenant dance. Like, my dad, my yeah. granddad my died. Dad died. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what was the moment that you thought it was time to, you had enough? Well, there's a really... There's a really, it's changed, but there was a, a really toxic environment going on in the peacetime military where guys, because they weren't getting to do what they signed up to do. They couldn't release that testosterone. Yeah. Yeah, and it was, and, and, and to your point earlier about the, the, you know, you want to conquer or do whatever. I think a lot of guys really want to do two things, preserve life and expand freedom. They really want to go and do something that's going to change, even if it means dying on the beaches of Normandy. You really want to be the one that was remembered of like, I was there because, because those people needed me to be there. Mm. And a lot it's, of guys, the call. yeah, and a lot of guys really, and they didn't think they could, and then they did. And then all of a sudden they were like, like, like I, I did, I, I did that. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of, I mean, I could only imagine look, being a World War II <coughs> veteran looking back on the war and thinking like, I was there. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really, but you want to be a part of something like that. And for a lot of them, it was, it was just obvious. Like, yeah, that was my dude. Like they didn't, they, yeah, didn't, I mean, they don't, you know, because yeah. you watch the old war movies. I don't know. I watch them and I'm like, I'd be terrified because you're thinking about it in war, in peacetime. But at that time, you know, you hear the stories of Chris Kyle and how he, yeah. why he joined and. You know, it's just like a, a switch goes off and you just have a certain level of certainty. I mean, you have to have that to be willing to jump on a gun on a helicopter. Well, and I don't think yeah. you have, you don't have time to second guess anything. You know, you just, just kind of, it's, but that's why training is so important. It's just muscle memory. I mean, you do gunner down drills a thousand times. Being in vehicles like we were, if a gunner goes down, you rip them out of the turret and someone gets up in the turret. I mean, it's just, it becomes like a second nature or it's like it just happens the guy that's still in the truck treats the casualty you get up in the somebody whoever's you know whoever wants to get some gets up in the gun it's the, the it just has to happen so, what but what was that what was the hardest part about transitioning like I, I told you the story earlier when i was done at east carolina we played our last yeah ball game it's a weird feeling i remember getting back to the locker room clearing out my locker these are people i'd seen every day the training staff yeah. everyone but i wasn't on the team anymore you can feel it. It's it's the weirdest feeling. Like I've been on this team for four years, yeah, for three years, and now it's just like, all right, Matt, have a great life. You know, it's kind of. Like I would argue like. the transition's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. And and honestly, with this whole conversation, I can only speak to my experience. I'm also not, you know, some. I didn't do 20 years as a general officer. I don't know. Have I'm not privy to all of the information. I just remember what I remember, and I felt what I felt, but. For me personally, getting out was the worst part of the entire thing. No matter how hard some of the things I did were, no matter how miserable I had been sleeping in a hole full of water with, you know, or freezing, cuddling with another guy in a sleeping bag for warmth, kind of, no matter how brutal anything was, These guys are getting out. Than women. Guys are yeah. Hairier. And they move a lot more. <laughs> and it's just not comfortable to see next to you. They kick and punch and fight for the pillow. And I call this spin. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah no for sure you get home it's like really comfortable i would imagine like it's almost too comfortable yeah it's it is weird honestly i my, I, I i hate sleeping in a bed my bed gives me more back pain than anything else i i've actually seen a guy on youtube that slept on the floor for 30 days most and said would recommend that and yeah. said it fixed his back and i was like honey i think i'm gonna sleep on the floor for 30 days 
She's just like, go for it, whatever. Yeah, whatever, <laughs> you want to. Bed. <laughs> Freak. She's like, starfish. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I get the whole bed. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a good trade. So how does, but, how does going from the military translate to civilian life? I mean, are some of the things that you learned in the military, how does that kind of osmosis over? Yeah, so that's a hard thing. Um, you actually go through something called TRS, which you have to do in order to get your DD-214 at the end, which is the paperwork saying that, like, you no longer have to be here by law. Um, and so TRS is basically like a way to get guys to learn how to, like, write a resume, mm -hmm. translate your job skills in the military to job skills in the civilian world. Because if you think about it, if you're 18, you get out of high school, you're 18, you join the military, you do four years, um, you get out from there, you all you know of, of real life is what you knew in high school. So you've never really had to get into the job market. You've never really had to uh, fight competitively for some sort of corporate job or any job for that matter. I mean, you've most of the time being honest, like at that age, like either your parents got you a job or you've been working some. You, you never had to lower, discipline yourself yeah. to yeah. get yourself out of bed. Like well, just, you've never had to sell yourself. Right, right. You've never really had to say like, hey, these are my skills. This is my value. And this is what I would like to do for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so. And especially from my perspective, being infantry, I'm not going to go out unless I would, if unless I wanted to join law enforcement or maybe contract for the government and go do stuff overseas for There's whatever. There's like ready-made careers for military. Which is cool. Like, I mean, and a lot of guys, a lot of infantry guys do get out and go do law enforcement, fire, EMS. I mean, you have a lot of mm -hmm. medical training in the infantry. So you get out and you go do, you might be EMS, fire, law enforcement, some other kind of. Um, Similar type. Yeah, job. which is like your your cert. You know, people say thank you for your service, and it's you you kind of hate that because you feel like I didn't serve enough, so I don't mm -hmm. I don't even want the appreciation for it because other guy you know whatever. But you do want to serve. That's kind of like the I mean, it's the reason why you you for some people, if not most, it's the reason why you join. But um, you want to do something to serve others in some way, um, in some capacity. And it doesn't really translate unless you're a police officer, SWAT, fire, something like that, which is something I entertained for a long time. Sure. Um, I, you know, I, I thought of, but, you know. It's like uh, athletes going into coaching. Sure. Or, or commentating. Or yeah, whatever. or something that just kind of keeps you in the in the the field of that because you you love it so much you want to stay doing something but at the same time some people have the idea of like well if i loved it so much i'd still be doing it otherwise mm -hmm. i'm going to get out and do something totally different mm -hmm. because i want to change i want to do something completely different um but you know for me personally it was you know if i was going to get out and do law enforcement i i really like srt or swat was something that really interested me but i didn't want to live in a big city and places that weren't like major metropolitan areas didn't really have a good program for, I mean, not, you know, unless you're in, you know, Raleigh, there's really not a big, and like. Then, and then you realize that Jacksonville. Yeah. Because you know Jacksonville's got the yeah. largest SWAT team on the East Coast. I didn't know um, it was the largest. On the East Coast, because we have so many military. Yeah. Ex-military infantry from Camp Lejeune and stuff, that they would just, okay, and then, so we. Well, I wish someone would have told me that know, three so, years ago. A lot of the guys that from SWAT <laughs> huge. that will they go to Texas, they go to Florida, they go everywhere. Yeah. I mean, they ship them out. But at the same time, I mean, you were married though, so it's like part yeah, of me, and we were having to, a kid. Yeah, I was gonna say. So like, part of me was just kind of like I'm look, trying to kick indoors. It's time to slow down. Maybe you know, and all. I mean, my, my you know, in, it's amazing how some people do twenty years. Mm. And my hats off to you because really, your body at the end of that is like, I mean, especially like after playing pro sports or any sports after so long, you're just like, everything hurts. Mm. So I don't know how I could physically continue to do this. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm still I, like my chiropractor and I are, you right. know, I, I like to go a lot. Yeah. It's just something that like after a while you're like, do I want to keep doing something that's, you know, that, that way. Mm -hmm. um, so you went into, from the military, which was body labor intensity to, construction which is body labor intensity <laughs> <Body Yeah. laughs> well the beauty is, is that at posting, least carry bags of concrete if oh, you got work, it if I'm you there. work hard enough for a certain period of time 
you can become successful enough to start paying other people to do ah, said work. Ah, there you go. And that's the goal is like, you know, get big enough to where we can start subcontracting these things so that maybe we can stop breaking our so bodies. you can sit in while we, yeah, and drive around. Yeah, exactly. Which is, like you know, it. ultimately the goal. But at the same time, there's a trade-off because it's like yeah. you kind of look back and you're like, man, I, I'll get out I'll get out there and throw two by fours around. Yeah. You know, like, because me personally coming from the military, you know, there's a – it may say, I mean, it kind of, I'm sure in, in sports is a lot of the same thing, but there's like this fraternity kind of mindset of like being for the boys. Like, I'm yeah, just, man. I love the boys. Like, I will do anything for the boys. Camaraderie, man. And, and if they're struggling, I'm going to be out there struggling with them. And if they're lifting heavy stuff, even if I'm in charge of them, like what leader wouldn't be out there lifting heavy stuff with them? You know, like that's the, that's how you gain trust from your subordinates is to be the one that's out there in the rain in the cold, I would never ask you to do something them. I wouldn't do. Absolutely, or I haven't done. And you watch any movie, any military movie, and the lieutenant raises his gun. And he's like, "We're charging the bunker," and of course, he's the first one up. And it's like that you have to, you know, you, your guys aren't going to jump over out of the trench unless you're out of the trench. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to. And who would tell some private to be the first one out of the trench? Yeah. It's not, you know, you have to lead by example. So it's it really is like a, you know, and those are the skills when you transition that you do have to try to remember like you have when you go to a company or you go anywhere in whatever job you do you have to find a way to to translate what you know from the military Mm -hmm. to the civilian world where like no one knows what a a a, you know platoon leader is Mm -hmm. but if you on your resume say platoon manager people might start to think like oh oh, he was a he was a management level guy in the military Mm -hmm. i don't know what he did but at least i knew there were people under him and he knows how to take charge of people Mm -hmm. and then you can start to translate things like you know leading training exercises Mm -hmm. or you know being the range safety officer on a machine gun range doesn't Mm -hmm. translate to the boardroom but conducting training does right you know and and leaning leading people in training and also Translates. being able to follow instructions, follow like mm-hmm. direct. I mean, that's that was the yeah. hardest thing for me. So, one hundred percent of military guys have to go through boot camp, and one hundred percent of military guys at some point, yep. if they are unless they get unless, out, unless you, they, you know, perish, mm-hmm. are going to be former Marines, right? You at figure, some point. Well, you say, I mean, enlisted, they go in maybe eighteen on average, nineteen, sure. twenty ish, twenty years. You're 38 years old. Yeah, man. Which is a hell of a way to collect a pension for the rest of your life. You yes. know what I mean? 38. You're, that's pretty good. I recommend it. Hello, pension. Stay in until you're 20, 38. You're set. But, yeah, it's kind of those golden handcuffs. But, yeah, so, I mean, I know you can only speak on your personal yeah. interpretation of life after. Everybody has a different experience trends. in and out. Yeah. So but it's there's still that same familiar. I've talked to enough former athletes to know it, we miss the camaraderie. We miss yeah. that. Being part of something bigger than yourself. Or just having a purpose in general yeah. that you feel like you're needed for. You, yeah. you're, without you, X could not be accomplished or whatever, fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. So, but the, that's the hardest thing about, well, it's not the hardest thing about getting out um, and the transition. It's not, the hardest thing is not the purpose because, you, you know, everybody understands when you get out, you need to find a purpose. You know, whether it's your family, whether it's your career, whether it's, you know, your travel experiences or whatever. Um, The biggest thing that no one tells you is the sense of loss. The, and the only reason I know this is because um, during my process with meeting with the VA for when you, when you, when you go through um, the, the meeting with the VA clinics after you get out medically, um, uh, when I spoke to one of the VA psychologists that I had to see to fill out the forms and whatever, um, he asked the typical questions any shrink would ask. You know, you stand there at the table with him and, and you're, you're talking and, and he's explaining or he's asking you like some of the things you're going through with, you know, the transition and, and everything like that and like what's, what's going on with you, how you feel. And um, Are you going to murder your wife now that you're out? <laughs> Basically, that's what they're trying to figure out. <laughs> well, I mean, just... just you know, because there is a huge, I mean, what is the, the exact 22 veterans a day commit suicide? Yeah, the whole, you know, absolutely. veteran homelessness is a, a, a huge problem. Um, the, the thing that he had brought up was that you have to understand what you're going through is grief. 
And I didn't really. I mean, what do you mean, grief? Didn't you resonate. Know? I'm a marine. He's we like, but you, grief. but you understand, like, you have to understand that, like, all of your friends were here, your whole life was here, and now they're all gone. You know, like, and it's really you got to. It's hard to. It's hard enough to keep up with your parents yeah. and your siblings. And to text and call and say, like, hey, I miss you, love you, hope you're doing well, what's going on in your life, tell me about what your day was like, you know, like, because all of my best friends in the entire world, I knew everything they did throughout every single day of their lives, whether they were at work, on deployment, or at my house, where we were all hanging out and doing, you know, barbecuing and and doing stuff. You were all on the same team. But we were always together. Right. There wasn't really many moments we were apart other than when we were sleeping or just happened to not have time to coordinate a get-together. Mm-hmm. Because if we weren't together at work, we were together at home. Um, and what he explained was like, you know, your your brain is telling you that I mean, these people are basically dead. Mm-hmm. I mean, these people are gone. Oh, they're they're yeah. completely out of your life. They're And, and it wasn't <clears throat> like, oh, you know, like I just lost somebody. I just lost everybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like 30 of you, the, the best people you've ever known, whether they're the smartest or dumbest people you've ever known in your entire life, the 30 of the best dudes you've ever known. And all of those memories and all of the been day-to-day the, routines, the with, all yeah. the stuff that you've done together and all of the time that you spend together and all like, even on a Friday night at your house where you're hanging out, grilling and playing games or doing whatever, watching a football game or whatever. All of that stuff is now gone and over, and they're doing their thing. I mean, they're back home. Some of them are going to school. Some of them got jobs. Some of them are starting families, and now they're busy. And you know, the first few months, everyone's got group messages together. You it's know, everyone's in a group that text. Because you think, like, no, we'll be boys forever. Yeah, right. like there's no way, there's nothing and, that come through this. Bond. And you will <laughs> if if one of those guys called me tomorrow and yeah. said, "Hey, man, I'm in a rough spot." You know, do you have a gr- thousand dollars? I'll drain my bank account. I don't. I mean, I, I'll put my own family in jeopardy because I know I'll do anything to f- support them. If it can help you a little bit, I'll make this work. I and mean, that you are, but you are forever. I'm glad I know that. <laughs> we're, we're you that. are forever. You are. But you picked your not, weeds out of you. You know how men are. We can go five years without talking to someone. Talk to them. Sure. Right up where you left. Oh, yeah. I have buddies oh, that have yeah. come down to visit, and and when they leave. It's. I look at my wife and be like, man, it was like we didn't skip a beat. Yeah. It was like we haven't spent a day apart. Mm-hmm. It, even though we've both changed, especially in the state of the world today, we we both definitely changed. But your circumstances. But when we changed, got to yeah. yeah, but when we got together, nothing changed. But you find out that and I'm a lot older than both of you, <laughs> but uh, you find out that you do change over a time period. Your your yeah. Your, your Years have gone by. But your core remains the same. Absolutely. Your heart remains yeah, the same. And that's the hardest part because you become more of who you are as you get older. Yeah. Like at the gut, yeah. the gut level. God, but amazing. now the circumstance is tough. Well, and you also kind of just jump back to where you were because I don't know what you've been doing for the past year or two. But I remember where we were when we last were together and we both just revert right back to that. Yeah, bro, bro, bro. Like having a good time, just sharing. And, and it's, it is therapeutic because yeah. you get to then – reopen those memories that you wish you could talk about on a daily basis but no one understands so you're finally with someone that just gets you just yeah, understands yeah. you and i think one of the the biggest the most important thing is to to work hard at like i understand it's hard to keep up with your parents and your siblings and all that stuff but you really have to keep those guys together You have to check in on those guys. Every time I'm on Instagram and I open up and I see somebody posting something about like, hey, we lost another brother, somebody, you know, we lost him to whatever he was succumbed to, something that was going on in his head, something, you know, and it maybe it's something I don't even know. I don't know who they're with. I don't know what they did, but it just reminds you like, hey, just text everybody, you know, and just be like, hey, bro, how you doing? Because that, that's what Peyton, 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 Peyton was, said. I was going to say yeah. that his parting words, Peyton, who was on the last show, cerebral palsy, and like, hey, what would you, Billy, you asked, like, how would you make the world a better place? And he's like, just reach out. Like, if someone pops yeah. in your mind, reach out. Don't wait. Yeah, don't wait for a birthday. Don't wait for a Christmas. But, right, yeah. But it's tough because we all know this logically, 
right? We all know we should do this logically, but there is something when now that glue that was the military or that glue that the common was, piece. If you're doing, you talked about going on America's Got Talent, that glue of that association. Yeah. You know, so that's why I think the, uh, one of my pastors said, a lone soldier is a dead soldier. And there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, absolutely. Before and after the military, yeah. for sure. Yeah, and it, it's... It's it's imperative that you just realize that these guys want you to reach out. Like it's not like your mom and dad that just you know they love when you call them. I know, and it, everybody has their own thing going, and you get busy, and it's it's really tough to to think about like oh let me take a second and text so and so. But when I get a text from a buddy, my, my friend Connor and I both are huge Washington Capitals fans. Loves love hockey. And when there's a Caps game going, Connor will text me out of the blue, just like, what the hell are they doing? Or what's going on with this? Or how, how you know, or what, you know, something game related. I didn't even know he was watching the game. I don't even care about the game at this point. Connor texts me. And now I get mm-hmm. to say, how you doing, man? And it just, it's just a reminder to me that he exists still. And, 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 and I miss him terribly. That sense and, of loss you're yeah. feeling. Yeah. He's, he's not immune to But that. it goes away for a little bit. That sense of loss goes away because it's like now we're back together. Now we're mm-hmm. talking again. Now we're doing the same thing we used to be doing back you know, three years ago when we were just on a regular old Tuesday night and there was a Caps game going. We were just commenting back and forth to whatever was happening. You know, it's just – it's imperative to, to not lose no, – regardless of whether you went through Fallujah together – Vietnam, or whether you yeah. didn't, yeah. or whether you didn't even deploy anywhere, these people are such a huge portion of your life that you have to, you have to maintain that, or else you lose it forever. If you don't hold on to at least a part of it, and it may not mean anything to anyone else in your life, but you and those people. But if you let go of that completely, part of your entire identity. Part of what you feel like it makes you who you are, you know, and, and the best part of who you think you are completely vanishes forever mm. unless you somehow or get suppressed. maintain mm-hmm. it. Or, yeah, and it just it becomes like a memory that just you throw, sorry, like, did that happen? What, what, what happened then or what happened here? I can't remember. It's like, why can't you remember? Mm-hmm. Tell the story. Talk about it. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. and, the, and it's, a, it's hard because. You know, I work, I work with a guy every day who has to live through all of my, well, in the Marine Corps, you know, this, that, this happened or this happened because... I'm a platoon manager. Well, yeah, I mean, but they're kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Go get me those nails. <laughs> but like some of, the, some of the stories that may be relevant, in, even, even if it's comedically relevant, like, yeah. oh, yeah, this was also funny because he went to college, I went to the military, and we both have these fraternity-style stories of funny things that just took place in our lives. And he'll tell something, and I'll tell something, and then afterward I'll kind of feel like, not like a jerk, but almost like I don't expect you to get this because a lot of this doesn't make sense. But I have to tell, I have to say that I have to get, I have to talk about this because to me, it's like that it, part of me is on life support. I need to, like, yeah, and it it shaped so much of who I am as a human being. Right. So the the parts of me that I love the most, the best parts of me, the protector. The provider, the the leader, the parts of me that I feel like are the best was instilled in me from the military. Mm. Regardless of whatever my job was or what I did in the military or any of that stuff, the things that I took away in my transition, the transitionary part of me that 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 morphed into civilian Jordan, all came from the military. It didn't come from post-military or pre-military me. It all came from that experience. I, I would argue it was always it was revealed in the military. Sure, yeah, it just, it, it, it just yeah sure. Like a, so really, the desire to join. But it was, but it was. It's like drafted, forging. It like I, I may have been, I may have been metal before, but I was mm-hmm. forged into something. Right. That that I didn't want to be. I didn't want to carved you out. I didn't want to yeah. revert back to the old ways of doing things. I wanted to to figure out what that made me and how I can become. You know, a better father, a better husband, a better better leader in my home and at work and, and just in general. How do I take what I've learned, even though it doesn't translate to my job now? You know, I can't build a house with a 240 or yeah, a 50 well, we'll, we'll get into that because it, it could very well. I mean, and by the way, since this is therapeutic for you, uh, 
we need your address. We're going to send you a bill. That's right. <laughs> and your routing number because you said you'll drain your bank account. We got it. We have to support that the channel somehow. Right to oh, me. man. Oh, we, need more guys. we need more people like that. <laughs> so uh, speaking of your new profession, you went from the military and jumped right into construction, mm -hmm. basically. You said you, your partners were someone now. Yeah. Right, but in the he's beginning, he's the brains the, behind the operation. But in the beginning, it didn't. You were doing side jobs and stuff, right? Is yeah. Well, we, we we got? just when we were building our company, we just we took what work we could. We wanted to build houses, but you got to start somewhere. Yeah. And so we we just really we took our both of our knowledge of he had the degree, he had the the license, he had the know how, and I always grew up. My dad was like a I know how to do it. I'm not hiring somebody. So I grew up watching him do things and I knew how to do I knew how to use every tool. Everything is figure outable. Right. So I knew how to use the tools. You just need to explain to me how we construct this thing and I'll I'll help you make it. I just mm -hmm. I knew how what the tools did. I knew how to use the said tools. It was just more of a, you know, it was so, and the two of us have played really well together off of that where we just kind of both of us have different backgrounds and we've come together to kind of make this Complement each other. Yeah, we really, yeah. yeah. And now with YouTube University. Algorithm. Absolutely. Yeah, man. And I won't lie to you. There's been many a job where we've been like, eh, let's, let's YouTube look at it. A hundred percent. That's yeah. the worst. Like a client. We do. I think we do. Question, question. But I'm the like, client only cares question. if the I'm job like, is done and, and looks great and is and works and everything comes out. So if you need some help, get some help, you know. And, every, and that's, Every time gotta, we get a piece of You got to be humble. You got to understand, like, no one knows everything. Yeah, the the jack of all trades is a master of none, but the mm. master of one. Or wait, how does the a jack of all trades is a master of none? This is all rhymes, but always like. better than a master of one. He's really going to put this. You thing, know, he's going to you know? put this on a track, yeah. right? Yeah, I he's mean, gonna... I, I always talk about like if you want to be well well rounded, is I always say, look, you want to know everything about something and something about everything. Yeah, if you do that. You can because you can figure it out, and that's that was the best thing that the that the military industry. taught me was. That you, you may not, you always adapt and overcome. If you don't know how to do something, figure it out and find a way to do it. And that, and that translates to any job that you do. Is that, you know, everyone always loves to use the term fake it till you make it. But you can only fake so much. What you need to do is, is eventually just... Eventually you got to make it. Yeah. Oh, you eventually you have to make it. Yeah. I mean, no one's going to just hire somebody that keeps faking it. And, right. and, and just, you know, at, at a certain point they're going to be like, bro, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. But... You can, however, be humble enough to say, I don't know what I'm doing. Let me seek some help and then figure it out. Because if you, if you just have the mindset of like, hey, I'm willing to learn. I want to I get better at this because now and, – and, and get better at it so I can do for you if you're a client. It, you know, I want to get better. I, I may be using you as, a, as a, a way to learn, but I will do what it takes to give you the final product that you want. Whether it means it's going to cost me money. There was actually, there's a guy around town actually that has like a sign that says uh, something along the lines of like how we will do good work for a profit. But if it means not taking a profit, always doing good work. Mm. So no matter what, you're, like, you're still going to give the final product of great work. Mm. But, but I want to do it for a profit. That's why anyone goes into business. Mm -hmm. But if it means that I need to take a loss, my reputation, my name, my legacy, my my work is going to still be good. Yeah. And I think that's something that, you know, that you can take if you are from the military and you are transitioning to a civilian job, you can you can offer a company great work because you will sacrifice and you will do the things necessary to no matter what, even if it means humbling yourself and and getting to your low, which at a lot of times with anyone that's been in the military, they've been at a very low point. They still that's, overcome that's it. That's boot camp. Sure. Yeah. Or, or, We're and, all getting humbled. But, you know, boot camp's the easiest thing you do in the military. It's, it's, there's so many more things that it, test you. It is once you have the um, other experiences. Of hindsight. But like right, at yeah. the time, sure. it's at the, the yeah, hardest it, shit. For sure. But it's the yeah. only thing you've done. Right, it's all right. you know. Yep. But then later on, you're like, man, if I went back to boot camp tomorrow, I would be... It would just be so easy. It'd be a breeze. I'd be the, the, the best guy there. It's no problem. <laughs> yeah. But because of the fact that you have, yeah, you have hindsight, but there's other things that I've done 
in the military that I've, I've looked back and been like, man, I wish boot camp was a breeze mm. compared to fill in the blank. But if you can take that sort of mentality to transition into whatever career you're going to get into, that sort of like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to figure it out. Don't know I what will, I don't fi- know. you know, I'm yeah. going to do it. Right. I'm going to figure it out whether I have to either humble myself and ask for help. Because a lot of times in the military, you've got people that come to you that don't know something that come to you and say like, hey, I, I want to learn this. Mm-hmm. I want to get better at this. I want to be more proficient at this. And if whether it's shooting or medical stuff or just even land navigations, anything, you have guys that will come to you seeking help. And there's something about humbling yourself and learning something that's outside of your realm of your scope of knowledge that you're mm-hmm. like, I don't know this, but man, I, I want to know it and I want to be the best at it. And and the competition that's bred in the military, the competition that's bred in sports, the mm-hmm. competition that's bred everywhere, everything's a competition. Everything is a competition. It's a big dick measuring contest. All of it. <laughs> even, even in business, even sales is a competition. You yeah. always want to have a higher sale number mm-hmm. than everyone else around you because it's rewarding. You, you mm-hmm. love being the, everyone loves being the best. And that was something that I always, you know, wanted to, to instill in my, my guys that were under me is that like, I don't care how good we actually do. You will be a savage at everything mm-hmm. you do. You will, when people look at you, they're going to look at you and be like, good Lord. And, and like, football, man, look at that kid run a gun up a hill. That's what I'm saying. Football, they said, if you make a mistake, make it full speed. Yeah, absolutely. You know. Because if you're giving 100% and you fail, no one cares. Mm-hmm. But if you're meandering up a mountain and, and you fall over, people are like, get up. Mm-hmm. No one has any empathy for that. Yeah. But if you're giving your soul to something, you know, and, and that has to translate. It cannot just be like, oh, well, I was in the military and it's such a noble cause and I gave my 100%. And then when I got a job afterward, I just kind of like fell into line. You're you're not gonna you're not gonna succeed. You're not gonna because so is, is that why you switched and, and wanted to work for yourself and be more of, of a I was because just, you know that working you can... for myself was a blessing. That was literally just the kind of thing for me that like my talk buddy about, talk about humility, huh? Yeah. Well, I mean my my <laughs> buddy <laughs> the he's greatest boss on he, earth. <laughs> he, my but my, bu- my buddy my boss is the one that said like I- i'm gonna go get my general contractor's license i'm gonna take the test i'm gonna buy the thousands of dollars in books i'm gonna go you know do all the things necessary because so that you we gotta can- have a fat bank account to get a gc license to maintain well it. The, the biggest thing is you have, have to have backing. you have to have the discipline to learn the amount of knowledge now he had a degree in it so i know he had he has the knowledge but to pass the test I mean, it's an open book test, but guys fail two, three times. It's an open book test, but people still fail. So it's not like it, that. That just kind of is a testament to how hard the test is. They're morons. Hmm. <laughs> Can we? You got you got everything open for you. But you have a timeline, so you have to do you have to do all of that within a specific amount of time. So you you have to know all of the questions and and where to look it up. Sure, where when yeah, how to reference it and whatever. We we talk about all the time on the show. So everyone talks about wanting to be great, right? And we always talk about be great at what you're good at, right? Mm -hmm. So like, there's certain ways that we are wired that we naturally do that has our yeah. He's great at pissing me off with that damn ice. <laughs> the ice you told me about he has, the ice. He isolated his goodness. He told me he was going to do it at some point. But, you know, we are wired in a certain way that gives you the capacity to be great. You know, there's a lot of motivational speakers that will say, just put in 10,000 hours, you'll be great. And you're like, all right, I'm going to psych myself out. But if you hate doing it, you're never going yeah. to right. get burnt out. You know, and that was how I was when I was working at the airport. I, I just kind of got burnt out, didn't love doing it. Yeah. That yeah. was kind of how that was. Did, how did the did the military? I mean, I know it's one thing about the military. There's people are serving roles, just like in football. Like I played a very small role, but it was an important role. You right? Know, yeah. Like, as we learned, crucial. In my, in my as career. far as the game is concerned, it's crucial. <laughs> if you screw it up, yeah. Um, but how did that translate? I mean, it probably lets you know, like, hey, I don't have to do it. I was in a, within a system of like, hey, I focus on my shit. They focus on theirs. We all meet together. And... I think the biggest thing you can take away is leadership. If you're going to transition out of the military and you're going to go to any job, any job, whether it's McDonald's or a Fortune 500 company, 
you have to understand that you are a leader. Even if you were a lower enlisted, I'll say E3, like E4. Man in the military. Yeah, with, with no civilian side, you know, there's no civilian translation other than law enforcement or something with a gun um, or medical or something like that. But even if you were, you got out and you were still of a lower rank, you, you were still to somebody a leader. Or you still learned leadership by having good and bad leaders above you. And I say good and bad because bad leaders teach you a lot more than good leaders. Bad leaders teach you what you don't want to be. Yeah. Which as long as you do the polar opposite of bad leadership, you'll be a good leader. Basically, here. someone asks you to do something they wouldn't be willing to do. Oh, absolutely. That or something that's just completely – that just – you know, what I hate doing is asking people to do things that don't make sense. Like, hey, move all those things over here. So that later we can move them into the dumpster. Just busy why don't we just move them into the dumpster? Right. You know, it's like, why would we move things twice or three times? Why would we be so inefficient? We're and, smarter, not harder. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and military is all about because everything, money drives everything. It's all about efficiency because you're paying people to do a job and you want it to be done efficiently. I thought it was about freedom. Well, yeah. Mm. I, to other governments. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so what, how many employees do you have now? Just two of oh, it's you. Just the two of us. Two man. Of okay. We just yeah. So we have we subcontract a lot of work. We do. I mean, we have framers and drywallers. Oh, and okay. Have, so, but okay. they're all different companies. We subcontract to do our work. Temporary employees. Right. So how will do you think that by being in the military and learning the leadership, how would you when you do get employees? How do you feel like you're going to lead them? So. I mean, that's a great question because they're a different company. So it's not like I'm their boss, but in a sense, you kind of are because as well, the, they're working under you under a subcontract, right? So when you say like, "Hey, we need to, you know, we need these things to change to this plan," they're going to do the things that you say because they've been hired to work for you, kind in in a in a weird way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but to me, the biggest thing is about. To me, from the infantry, people call them people call infantry guys grunts. I was gonna say grunts. They're right. grunts, grunt workers, right? And when you think of your grunt workers, you think of the guys doing the work. You don't think of the management guys. You don't think of the the guys that are just making phone calls or pointing a finger and saying like, "Hey, do this, do that, do this, do that," and delegating all of the tasks, and then sitting back and they're, watching and supervising. The implementers, yeah. <clears throat> the military tells you the most important step is supervision. So the most important step of anything is supervising. You have to make sure it's trust but verify. Right. You have to always be there to make sure like, "Hey, you're going to clean all these these machine guns." But I'm going to sit here and watch you clean all these machine guns. But the thing is is that even in the civilian world, no one wants their boss to just sit there and point and then watch you do it. Mm-hmm. Clean a machine gun with them. It's going to lead by example. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, when, when it comes time, we, 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 a lot of times we are, one of the big things we do is, you know, when one of our guys needs materials, we go get materials. If you need, we, we go there, type up a list of, you need like this many two by tens, this many two by fours, as many hangers, as many nails, as many, all these different things that they may need to, you know, because we get a certain amount of materials to a job. They start the job and they say, hey, we're going to need this, 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 and this. Then we show up with a truck full of all this stuff and you can either do two things. You can either say, come unload all this stuff. Yeah. Or you can be the first guy pulling a piece of wood off the back of a truck so that all the other guys go, oh, we need to help them get all this stuff off the truck. And when you carry more of the stuff than the rest of the guys, when you go to tell them to do something later, they're a lot more receptive mm-hmm. to doing those a bit things. More respect, yeah, because they're like, "This guy would do it with us." Yeah, he's not afraid to get dirty. Yeah, because if 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 it came down to it, he'd pick up the nailer and get up on the roof and nail with us. If if we weren't here to do it for you know, if 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 we weren't the ones that were here to do it. He'd be doing it too. You're kind of like a laid back drill sergeant, right? Like the drill, you have to believe that drill sergeant can do everything. He's mm-hmm. like, command, absolutely. Command. I mean, like if you, he's fat and out of shape. He's the, be like, the, the, the drill instructor is the best shooter, the best dude, this, the best that, because nuts. you have to believe whether you are or not. Now these guys could best frame shit circles around. Too, I feel like they. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't have the skill. Half of our subcontractors have, but I would do that with them. If it, if it meant the it's 
being for the boys. Yeah. Get out there in the rain and snow, in the cold and heat, and do it with them. Well, and on top of so that, that if, they if you're out there doing it with you, since you are not as well versed as they are, say a roofer or a frame or sure, or when or they do whatever, it all day, every carpenter, day. I mean, you you're getting benefit by actually sitting there and watching them. Absolutely. Work and say, oh, well, okay. Well, two forty five is equal to ninety. If I can just cut this angle, you know, whatever the case sure. may be. But, you know, it's it's beneficial to you to get out there and get dirty with them so you can physically see. So in the future, you can mm-hmm. teach someone else. Or, sure. Yeah, but, so. And for me, like, a lot of times we don't end up going and doing, you know, I'm not going to go and step on their toes and start framing with them. They're the framers. They are, they're framers. They know what they're doing. But if I can make their day easier or if I can do something if you physical. you want a coffee? I'm going to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> yeah, well, but if I can do something to get them to understand that, like, I'm not just here to point a finger. I'm not just here to tell you what to do. Like, I will, I will be in the suck with you if, you, if need be. He's got our back. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I'm here to, to, to try to lead in a way that means leading from the front. So from what I hear you say, there's two components that you need, right, to be able and willing, right? So yeah. you've hit a lot on the willing side. Like, just be willing – so these guys know you have your back. So I think that's, I mean, that's huge in the military. Yeah. That's huge in corporate America. I mean, I think it's also important not to kid yourself. Like, dude, I'm never going to be able to replicate that camaraderie we had in the military. Sure. Like, I don't know. People are, you hear about it all the time. These CEOs that spend a, spend a year or spend a week with a, a SEAL or whatever to try and Right, replicate. right, right. Yeah. But Team building exercises. There's not yeah. that, that anxiety of if I fuck up. Someone could die. There's no way to replicate mm-hmm. that unless you went to SWAT or something like that. Sure. So, I mean, that's something I had to realize. I can't replicate the status I had in the NFL. I can't replicate that. Just it's cool, you know. And that I mean, that's probably a big part of it. So you stop searching for it. Like, just go reenlist if that's what you want. Right. You know, which but, is my recommendation. That's right. Just stay in. Yes. Yeah. Just it's, stay. It's so it's easy. The, it's it's so the much best. Easy. Just stay in. Just get two pieces of advice. Get out, stay in. <laughs> <laughs> so looking ahead five years, what would you tell the Jordan that's – you're 31 now. Uh, so say now you're 31, you're talking to a 36-year-old Jordan. What would you tell him? Or what would that guy tell you? From now to the future th- or from now to – now, all of your goals have accomplished. You've crushed it. You've done everything you want. That guy has a chance to time, time – uh, all right, come back. I here. think time traveled say? back. I think this this will hit a lot of the spectrum for any military guys, no matter how older you get or how far removed from the military you get. Is that remember the best parts, not the best part, not not just the best parts of who you were, but some of the skills and things that made you what you had such pride in. You know, re- remember. They didn't suddenly disappear. You know, like whether it's protecting others, medical training, things that you learned in the military. For me personally, and I don't know a lot, there's a lot of jobs throughout the whole spectrum of military. But from the infantry, when it comes to, you know, treating casualties, protecting people under the, you know, realm of like firearms and and self-defense and things like that, remember the the things that made you great at what you were doing and continue to be proficient at those things and find a way to utilize those things throughout your career, whether it's leadership, whether it's medical training. I mean, we're at job sites. Guys are using saws. You don't know how many people I know. It scares me because of how good I think I am with tools, with how many people I know that have lost digits or limbs from tools. I keep a trauma kit in my truck because I know how to use things in a trauma kit, mm-hmm. you know? Like I keep tourniquets and, and gauze and compression bandages and a needle D if you puncture a lot. I mean, like I know how to use these things, whether it's, whether it's legal or not, if you can save a life and you're good at it, remain good at it. Mm-hmm. Remain good at leading people. Remain good at, at, at adapting and overcoming. Remain good at administrative work. If, no matter what you've done, if you can take those skills and stay proficient at those things, you can 
continue to keep your identity of who you were in the military and translate it to who you're becoming as a civilian. Mm. You can stay who you were. You're just changing the title. You're just changing the job. You're just changing, you know, where you are geographically. But you can still have in the background those micro skills that that you can utilize in the future. And it may not be something you use every day. I'm not going to treat casualties at work. But when that day comes, but it's in by the God, I'm going to be there with my – I'm going to run to my truck, grab Dude, my like, kit. Someone's bleeding. And that's what – you know, This is what we train for. Even if even – if, <laughs> you, know, you don't know how many times when I have been – guy needs a Band-Aid. I'll pull out a trauma kit full of Band-Aids and things. <laughs> and I will rap and do all the fun things that like yeah. – it, but it validates all of the things that you identify as, that things – when I'm driving behind a school bus, that's the safest school bus in Carteret County. Mm. You, you have to maintain who you were. I got a paper tr- cut. Here's a crutch. Yes. Yeah, that's whatever need you need. Splint. Put a tourniquet on it. Uh, uh, right. what, but it, as long as you know, if you know what you're doing, if you're good at something, remain good at it and find ways in your new life to translate those skills and utilize them. You may never utilize them. But if I roll up on a car accident and there's no one there yet, I'm there. Knowledge is you know, like I, I'm there, and 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 what am I going to do? You know, am I just going to call nine one one, or can I be nine one one? You know, you have to be able to just take your skills, no matter what they are, figure out what those skills are, no matter what your job was, no matter what your lifestyle was like, no matter what deployments you did, no matter what your experience is, and find a way to translate that to to utilize those skills. Really dig deep and figure out what they are. What is your passion? And if it is preserving life and expanding freedom and, and trying to make other people happy around you and, and taking the people that are doing the grunt work on your job or at your business and make them feel like they're validated because you're doing it with them or whatever it is, find a way to take your experiences and share them with others in a civilian sense. You know, in a way that makes sense. You're not starting back at square one. No, you have a lot to offer. Yeah. If you think that you're getting out of the military and you your job may not specifically translate to whatever you're getting into, like mine, construction. You know, there are yeah construction. You know, sounds so fired up. But for a lot of people, it's a miserable (laughs) job. It's it can be miserable. Like if you were framing a house today. You'd be miserable. Well, this is Carter County. I don't think anyone's going to frame. Mm-hmm. Probably not today. Our guy, we, no one was, you know, no one was framing today. Yeah. You know but what? if you couldn't, if you can just find a way to take the best part of you and carry that on to whatever you're doing, I mean, you're going to succeed because you, you succeeded in the military. If you can succeed there, you can succeed in the boardroom, at the office, wherever. It's, it's the whole awesome. be great at what you're good at. Like, yep. Be great at what start, you're good like, at. Because that's your only chance. To but stay great. proficient at what you were great at. No, don't lose that. It's, everything is a absolutely. perishable skill. That's awesome. Don't, don't just you know, forget it and move on. You know, go keep training you know, I just it. had the thought when you get out of the military, because it's like once a Marine, always a Marine. It's just you're a Marine in peacetime for the rest of your life. Like there's a lot of time you got to figure out how do I – you know, you, you put me in, coach. Like you had mentioned that, like how do how does a marine? I mean, stay after, when 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 the Kabul sharp. airlift happened, it's hard. Two years out of getting out of the military, and you see what happened in Afghanistan. You're you're sitting on your couch going, Shh, man, I, I could be back in I right wish, now. I wish Afghani would. Uh, let's go. Well, it's it's just you want to you just see the people that need. It's not even about what. What you could do to p- bad people, it's about the people that are struggling and need help, and you just want to help them. Find, you know, and you can find in your, in your town, in your community, at your business, plenty of people that need help. So if you want to help people, you can, you can find ways to help people. And that, that will help you transition out. If you just want to help people, no matter what, at what capacity, you can find that on the civilian side. You can help any. I mean, there's anybody out there, even at work. People just need need to be. And it's just and it. It's not just your buddies that need to be reached out to. Mm. People at work need. You just need somebody to reach out to them. Yeah. You know, without talking about work, just how you doing? Reach out, That's, man. That is awesome. Peyton. Awesome yeah. stuff. 
Well, well, dude, we could go on forever. We could. We, we got to put a cap on this sometime. We're, we're going face. deep into yeah. this. <laughs> I appreciate you bringing this whiskey in. Yeah. So, it's good. Uh, Henry yeah. McKenna. But no, man, we appreciate it. Did, did you have fun? a good yeah. – yeah, thanks for having me. Did you have it's a good awesome. time? Yeah, I definitely needed it. It's getting fired up. These yeah, I know. It's a like brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? That's real. There's what glass of laser. <laughs> So no, and we're gonna have you back. Like you know, the idea that had, if if you don't mind, it it would be great to have you part of that that experience. I think I think that would be great. So guys, guys. do us a big favor: hit the subscribe button, smash the like button, and we'll see you on the next video. Peace. Sick, and we're out.